Welcome into the show. Cut the killer carbs. Dr. Justin Anderson, Metabolic Coaching, right here on AM580. You can always check us out on the web, metaboliccoaching.net. Of course, our number to call, 448-0322 at Metabolic Coaching. And you can check us out on Facebook, Cut the Killer Carbs on Facebook. Of course, along the way, if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call at any time throughout the broadcast, 745-5800. Text in 806-745-5800. Uh, good. Let me say good morning to Dr. Justin Anderson. Good morning, sir. How are good you? Good morning, Wade. I'm fabulous. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing good. Doing good. I uh, I had some carbs a while ago. I didn't, you know, a guy, Brad comes in talking about uh, the gun raffle and says, I brought you some burritos. And I said, yummy. And I had those. So my insulin spikes right now. <laughs> I'll tell you, it, um, I have burritos all the time. You just take the tortilla open, off. Open them up and use a fork. Yeah. What brother. happens is you get, once you start doing a low-carbohydrate diet, you become friends with the fork because you use a fork <laughs> yeah. for everything. You, you know, you used to hold the hamburger in your hands with the bun, and instead of that, you use a fork and you cut up your hamburger. Uh, you do the same thing for your uh, breakfast burritos. You open them up and use a fork it's that simple yes it is it's that simple or you know again wrap your hamburger in your lettuce make the lettuce yes. your bun i'll tell you we went to uh <laughs> burger fi right and at burger fi they made uh we said you no know, bun on our burgers and they wrap it up in about i don't know maybe a dozen pieces of iceberg lettuce and it was delicious so uh Maybe BurgerFi wants to sponsor the show, yeah. and they could uh, they could advertise their uh, bunless burger. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Today I want to talk about oils, oils, fat, because the diet is uh, the I, just an introduction for people. I teach people to to do a very low carbohydrate diet, and uh, for weight loss, diabetes, blood pressure, inflammation, pain, etc. But anyway, on a very low-carbohydrate diet, it's called LCHF. The LC is Mm low-carbohydrate. But the second part is HF, and HF is Mm -hmm. high-fat. But you need to pick the fats that are going to be healthiest for you. And uh, my recommendations will probably be the opposite of what you'll hear out there. But the the fats that are going to help you with weight loss, decrease your inflammation, and help improve your diabetes and blood sugars. Yeah, those high fats could be, I'm thinking of guacamole, coconut oils, um, you know, organic cheeses, uh, you know, those kinds of things, right? So the first thing, yeah, so the the guacamole, um, that's going to be, well, I guess we should start off with the, the guacamole is going to be a monounsaturated fat. That's mm-hmm. going to be good for you. Coconut oil is going to be a saturated fat. Sardines. And it's good for you. And then the sardines are going to be omega-3s. Mm-hmm. And so that that's good. That's all good on a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. The, um, the interesting thing is that we were told for 30 years or 40 years to get rid of the saturated fat and eat more vegetable oils. But the vegetable oils, there's an interesting experiment that a college professor used to do on his students and what he would do is uh, he would feed his college students vegetable oils yeah and he could feed them enough vegetable oils to get their triglycerides up into the diabetic range I mean not the diabetic range but people with type 2 diabetes tend to have higher triglycerides it could get give them enough vegetable oils to get their triglycerides up their blood sugar up into the diabetic range and make them insulin resistant (laughs) Wow. Just from the vegetable oils. Wow. So um, the the number one, the first fat that you should eat and that you should focus on would be um, uh, saturated fat. And saturated fat is going to be what's found in meat, uh, butter, the coconut oil that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, because your body knows what to do with saturated fat. Basically, 50% of every cell membrane in your entire body is made of saturated fat. So your body knows how to process saturated fat and how to deal with it. Um, Which is healthy for your body because that's what the way God designed us, right? That's the, way that's God, the whole point. Yes, that's exactly right. And that's, that's the way that we were designed to eat. The, um, so saturated fats, uh, your body knows what to do with them because your cells are made of saturated fat. 
Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what you should absolutely eliminate. You should eliminate hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. They're also called trans fats. Mm. And I'm, you guys have talked about this on different shows. But basically, the when they chemically hydrogenate a vegetable oil, um, they take a vegetable oil and they hydrogenate it with a chemical process which causes... Uh, adds hydrogen to it and when they do that it causes it to bend in a way that it your your body does not have an enzyme to break down that bent oil and since your body doesn't have a, a enzyme to break it down you end up with abnormal types of fat yeah. they get stuck in your cell membranes and they um you don't have a way to remove them you can't metabolize them you don't have it's not a natural fat so the interesting thing is that people are always, you know, they've told us to avoid saturated fat. The health authorities told us to avoid saturated fat for many years. That's right. Don't well, eat the eggs. They're bad for you. In all of the early studies, they would lump in a saturated fat tends to be solid at room temperature. And so they would lump in the hydrogenated vegetable oils, which are solid at room temperature, along with the saturated fats. And so they would say, oh, look, it, 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 we did this study, and people who eat more saturated fat, they have more heart attacks, they have more heart disease, or even they have more cancer. But the truth is, when you uh, unlump, you take out the hydrogenated vegetable oils from the saturated fat, that correlation goes away. And so um, hydrogenated vegetable oils, are I tell people to avoid those like the plague. Give us some examples of those again. Like what, you know, when you say Vegetable. hydrogenated oils, are you talking about? If you turn over any packaged food, you can look on the back and it'll say hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. Um, uh, Is that worse than sugar in your opinion? Uh, Ooh, I they're, stumped they're, the they're, doctor they're today. Both, they're both worse. <laughs> you know. I stumped I the have, doctor. I I have, uh, yeah. Well, I think pure cane sugar probably has got to be a little better than hydrogenated oils. Because those are just, I mean, they're nasty, right? I mean, well, I mean, I'll tell you that in one of the theories of of heart disease uh, in in the early days was that the new hydrogenated vegetable oils, that those were causing the spike in heart attacks, and one of the other theories was that it was a massive consumption of sugar, mm -hmm. and so uh, massive increase in the consumption of sugar. So my my advice to all of my clients is to uh, uh, to be 100% hydrogenated vegetable oil free and 100% uh, sugar free. All right. Let's go to the phones. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Yes, sir. I I watched a lot of cooking shows. Cooking and, shows? Uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> and they use a lot of uh, olive oil. And they use real butter. But they also use an awful lot of salt. I think they use too much salt, but I'm, I'm in agreement with the butter and olive oil. What do you think about that? So the recommendation for people to avoid salt is for people who eat a regular, normal, standard American diet. The standard American diet is 65% of calories come from carbohydrates, and that's bread, pasta, sugar, uh, fruits, fruit juices. Um, and the type of diet that I put people on is a diet that is 5% of calories from carbohydrates. So you decrease the amount of carbohydrates on the diet from 65% to 5%. So you might ask, well, what does that have to do with salt? Well, the recommendations for people to eat less salt and avoid salt is for people eating a regular standard American diet. Good point. Yeah. Um, I have had clients who have been on two or three blood pressure medications, and when they cut the carbohydrates out of the diet, their blood pressure normalizes, uh, and they're able to get mm. off of two or three medications. There are two really? doctors named Finney and Volick, and they do studies on people with a very low-carbohydrate diet. And they publish them in the scientific literature, the journals, and stuff like that. And what they do is they supplement all of their study participants with an extra 2 to 5 grams of salt per day. Your body actually needs salt. Uh, however, the combination, of, the combination of way too many carbohydrates, which is sugar, bread, pasta, potatoes, along with too much salt in the diet, it'll worsen blood pressure. But when you get on a diet that your body was designed to eat, which is low in carbohydrates, you actually need more salt. The word salary, uh, the word salary actually comes from the Latin word sal, which means salt. The Roman soldiers were paid in salt, 
and they were paid in salt because it's a necessary commodity. It's something that your body needs to survive. Without salt, you wouldn't survive. So um, when you're doing a low-carbohydrate diet, you need more salt. Um, when you eat the standard American diet, they'll tell you to eat less salt and take your blood pressure pills and your blood sugar pills. I see. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. What do you think about the butter and the uh, olive oil? Butter is a great uh, butter is a great oil to cook with and to heat. Uh, butter contains uh, mainly saturated fat, so it's uh, perfectly healthy. Um, to cook with. Olive oil in general you shouldn't heat it. Uh, olive oil is a monounsaturated fat and olive oil contains uh, monounsaturated means there's one place where uh, it doesn't have a hydrogen attached to it and so the olive oil can be damaged by heat. So really it would be better if you're gonna heat uh, a, a butter, if you're gonna heat an oil you want to heat something that's a saturated fat uh, like frying, baking, or, or broiling. Um, you use like coconut oil or butter. The olive oil, avocado oil, and macadamia nut oil, those are all monounsaturated, and all of those are best eaten cold, say on a salad with salad dressing, or to use as something like a dipping sauce. I wouldn't heat uh, olive oil, because heating it damages the oil, it oxidizes it. And when it oxidizes okay. it, then you get damaged oils that it get incorporated into your cell membranes. So you put out a cold... What would you what would you use to cook with to heat? You want to heat a saturated fat, which would be a, a, either an animal fat such as lard, uh, bacon grease. Really? Uh huh. Lard, bacon grease. You could use beef tallow, um, butter, and see. But butter has a low smoke point, and that's because of the protein in butter. It's not because of the fat. And so there's a, something called clarified butter, which has the protein removed. It's real common in India, and they sell it at stores here. It's called ghee, G-H-E-E, -E, or coconut oil. And because coconut oil, all of those are saturated fats, and those oils are safe to heat without being damaged. So if I cook a lot and fry a lot, use coconut oil? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Wow. Okay, well, good to know. Thanks. All right, thank you so much for the call. Appreciate the call. Good question, though, because you see that a lot in these cooking shows. And I would even take it a step further. I know uh, that as far as my wife is concerned, of course, her being a health coach and all, she's really in tune with all this stuff. But she's a firm believer in pink Himalayan salt. That's all she cooks with. Right. She will not use white table salt at all on anything because... There's two, she, she'll say it's all the iodine stripped out of it, and you need iodine in your body. There's two problems with the regular white, I mean the, the regular table salt. Uh, first of all, the regular table salt has all the trace minerals taken out of it. Mm -hmm. And second of all, uh, lots of times they use an anti-caking agent, which is made of aluminum, uh, and you don't need the excess aluminum. The pink Himalayan salt, um, the reason it's pink is because it has the different minerals in it. And so there are a bunch of trace minerals that you can get along with your salt when you take the Himalayan sea salt. So it's a good way to add trace minerals uh, in addition to just adding salt. And that's usually what I recommend for people is to stick with the pink Himalayan salt uh, and avoid the regular salt. I mean, if you're at a restaurant from time to time and you use it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but what about other kinds of salts? I mean, I'm just curious about... You know, either celery salt, there's this kind of salt, uh, garlic salt. What do you think about that kind of stuff? Do you, do you have any prep? Do you even think of, I mean, does that make any difference? I, it doesn't make much difference to me. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, the, the thing that you always have to watch out for is any kind of salt mix. Uh, they may add monosodium glutamate, which is MSG. And uh, lots, of, lots of the spice mixes and salt mixes will have MSG in it. The problem with MSG, from my standpoint, is that MSG is an appetite stimulant. Oh. And so people who are trying to lose weight, uh, stimulating your appetite along the way is not doing you any favors. Mm -hmm. And so what I, sometimes when people go on to a very low carbohydrate diet for a couple of weeks, it's for anywhere from four, four to 14 days, they can have some transitional symptoms where they feel 
um, they're normalizing their salt balance during this period so they need more salt they can feel kind of headachey or flu like symptoms and so I oftentimes recommend they take bouillon or Himalayan sea salt just take a teaspoon and then drink some water the bouillon I recommend is Rapunzel brand bouillon they have it at Sprouts in different places and the Rapunzel bouillon does not have MSG and most of the other brands that I've seen do so Rapunzel bouillon is a good one you can also take it when you're fasting Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the show. Uh, Wade, what is your doctor's opinion on statin drugs? Uh, my doctor put me on, uh, I can't pronounce it, abistatin or something like that. And uh, on my last blood work here a week or two ago, my cholesterol had come down and was in normal range. But I've been hearing some bad press about statin drugs. Do you know anything about that? Have you ever had a heart attack? No. Are you type 2 diabetic? Yes. Yeah. Now, that's another thing. Uh, I'm, my doctor, Medicare has, has put a lot more things on doctors that they got to do, I guess, to keep their certification or whatever. And he did an EKG in the office, and he said that he wants me, he set me up for a stress test. Um, I've never had, now I have a history of heart trouble in my family, but I've never had, uh, I've never had anything, you do know you, what I mean, I've never had Do you know what your hemoglobin A1C is? Uh, yeah, the last time it was under 7, it was like 6, 8, I think, or something like that. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, um, the, the st my opinion of statin drugs is, is kind of complicated. But basically, for, to start off with, for a type 2 diabetic, the number one single best thing you can do is to have a normal hemoglobin A1C, which is going to be get your blood sugars to where they're dead normal 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and it, which would be get your A1C down into the fives. Okay. Um, uh, because damage to the blood vessels starts even at an A1C of 5.2 and going wow. higher. So you want to be 5.2 or below. Um, which may sound impossible. However, with a combination of a very low carbohydrate diet uh, plus uh, medications as necessary, you can achieve that without having yeah. blood pressure low. I mean, blood sugar lows. The yeah. American Diabetes Association has shown that for every one percent reduction in the hemoglobin A1C, you get a forty-five percent reduction in your heart disease risk. So the single, That's a lot. Wow. It, it's a lot. Yeah. So, so the single best thing you can do is have normal blood, have non-diabetic normal blood sugars. Uh, and that can only be accomplished through the combination of diet uh, plus some medications if they're necessary. Uh, talking about the statin drugs, there, there are many studies that show that statin drugs uh, do have a statistical benefit for people who have already had a heart attack. Okay. Uh, there is a wait for men who have already had a heart attack. There's about half as many studies which show they give some benefit to men who have not yet had a heart attack, but they're at risk. And so you're in the at risk group. Right. Um, the the way that they will publish the numbers is they'll say there was a 50 percent reduction in heart attack or a 33 percent reduction in heart attack in the people who take the medication. Uh, they call that a relative risk reduction. And relative risk is basically they'll put 100 people on a statin drug for 10 years, and they'll compare that to 100 people who don't take the statin drug for 10 years. Well, if the people who are taking the drug, if they only have, uh, say, one heart attack in the group that's having a, taken the drug every day for 10 years, mm -hmm. one out of 100, but in the group that is taking the that is not taking the drug, they'll have two heart attacks out of 200. Well, if you do the actual math, the, the reduction in your risk, the absolute reduction is 3% minus 2%, which is 1. So one yeah. absolute risk, 1% of the people benefit. But if you do the math to calculate what's called relative risk, and it's something they do in statistics, then you take, um, if there was two heart attacks in the group that's not taking the drug, and one heart attack in the group that is taking the drug, well, 2 minus 1 is 1, and 1 divided by 2 is 50%. So they'll say it's a 50% reduction in heart disease risk over 10 years, which equals 
an absolute risk reduction of 1%. And the whole point is it when they say it benefits when they say there's a 50% reduction, a lot of people think half of people who take the drug benefit. Yeah. It actually turns out that it's about 1 or 2% of the people who take the drug benefit. So the the benefit is not as high as it is uh billed basically. Right. Right. Um the problem with stat one of the problems with statin drugs is that you're a type 2 diabetic and according to the Mayo Clinic uh, taking a statin drug worsens your blood sugar and it worsens your diabetes so the statin drug may reduce your cholesterol but it's going to worsen your diabetes and the best thing you can do to lower your heart disease risk is get your diabetes 100 percent under control so that's one of the issues the other issue is that um, even it published in the insert on the statin drugs, it says it can cause uh, memory problems or even dementia-like symptoms. And so there are lots of people who get on these drugs and develop those kind of dementia-like symptoms, and they just attribute it to old age. They're getting older. Yeah. Their memory's not as good. Wow. Well, the problem with that is that um, uh, 25% of all the cholesterol in your entire body is in one organ, and that organ is the brain. And so when you wow. be, when you take something like a statin drug and it, it deprives your body of cholesterol, lowers your total cholesterol, it's lowering the cholesterol in your brain, which your brain actually needs to function. Your brain uses the cholesterol as part of the mechanism to insulate the nerves. Just like you insulate a wire in a building, y- your brain uses cholesterol to insulate those nerves. And um, I can tell you personally from my experiences that my, my dad was having... Uh, trouble and he said you know he said I just I just can't I used to be able to drive all night long he said I just can't stay up and drive or I and uh, he went from sleeping probably six hours a night to eight hours to 12 hours to 14 hours and so and he was just going downhill with his health he developed AFib and his cognitive function which is his brain function was just getting worse all the time and so I, I asked him, I said, well, did this started six months ago. I said, did anything change six months ago? And were you put on any medication? Because maybe it was some sort of medication. And the one medication that changed was that he was put on the statin drug, put on one of these cholesterol pills. And so I just said, talk to your doctor, see if you can do a trial of a couple of months off of the cholesterol pill and see if things get better. And everything turned around and he got better. So. Yeah. Basically, wow. uh, the adverse effects are real, and they affect about 17% of the people who take the cholesterol pills. Um, the benefit is real. The benefit of a cholesterol pill is real, but it benefits about 1% or 2% of the people in the studies, the big clinical trials, uh, who take the cholesterol medication. So um, I usually, my preference would be for you to change your diet and get on a very low carbohydrate diet like we teach at metabolic coaching which will lower 13 of 15 risk factors for heart disease including your blood yeah. sugar your blood pressure and all that sort of stuff and yeah. then rather than take a statin drug uh, which basically decreases two of 15 risk factors for heart disease so that would be my my preference oh well you know my problem or my weakness i guess is the carbs uh, I feel like I eat pretty healthy, but man, I love the carbs, <laughs> and it's it's hard for. But I'm I've been following it so, and I enjoy it. Let me ask you one more thing about the about the uh, stress test. He seen something on the EKG that he did in his office, right? Uh, and I'm not I'm not uh, asking you to go against my doctor, but uh, what would he have seen that he wants me to have a test set on a, on an EKG? Well, I'll tell you, I'm I'm not a cardiologist, but oh, okay. I, I well, will. He's not, he's not either, but he probably saw some abnormality in the waveform, the rhythm of the heart, and so oh, to doing a stress test, he'll just stress your heart, and they get yeah. your heart pumping faster to see if those abnormalities uh, become more pronounced, so that they can identify a specific uh, part of the heart or area of the heart that might not have is good at blood flow and if you're yeah. if the blood flow gets worse under stress that's your stress yeah. test uh, then they may need to do some additional procedures to help open up some of those arteries well 
that's what he said. He said it, it, if it shows something like that, then they may talk about putting a stent in or something like that. His idea was we didn't want to wait till I had a, had a heart attack and then try to, yeah. you know, you're getting into open heart surgery and all that. So, but overall, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. But you know, the, I, I'm going to work on that on those that the one c because I've never the lowest I've ever been is six four. And and yeah. those. Those numbers are good, you know, like six four, six eight. Those numbers are good, but if you want, if you to protect your heart in the long run and protect your feet from getting diabetic neuropathy, protect your yeah. eyes from getting diabetic retinopathy, uh, protect your kidneys from getting kidney disease. You, your goal should be to have normal blood sugars, just like a non-diabetic. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to read a book that will give you the ins and the outs of exactly how to how to achieve normal blood sugars okay. I recommend you read a book called Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution okay. uh, Richard K. Bernstein MD he's a medical doctor and he's I think 83 years old this year and mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a diabetic himself and okay. the only way you live to be 83 if you're a diabetic is that you maintain normal blood sugars and so yeah. he's, he's worked that out for himself and he's taught uh, his patients how to do it for 40 years oh, or join no, join join out. us for the join the metabolic coaching program because the your your issue is going to be like you said you know you your weakness is the carbs you love the yeah. carbs right right well right. the bread and the potatoes and the, you know <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, good stuff. the thing but is you that know what? everybody I, does it's not yeah. just you right and you know i've really i've really been blessed i guess uh, I've been diabetic, uh, I think I was diagnosed in 2002, maybe, or three. I've never had any problem with my feet. I get an annual eye exam and haven't ever had any trouble with that. So. The, one of the things that we do in the metabolic coaching program is we give people a CD and or you can download it online, but the CD has audio tracks on it, which they're like meditations or kind of guided meditations, and they work like they work in a similar way to hypnosis, and they help you to cut those cravings because people they crave car bread, they crave potatoes, they crave sugar, and yeah. so that's of all the things that my clients have told me over the years, those audio tracks are the most helpful thing and they just cut their cravings and so it, the idea of the the coaching program is to make things easy instead of hard you know the crazy thing and i'll let you go i'm i've taken a lot of time but the, the crazy thing about it before i was diagnosed with diabetes uh -huh. i hardly ever ate any sweets and then when i started when i found out i had diabetes i had diabetes uh i want sweets and i'm mean, asked hey I used to never drink a Coke or anything. Right. And then once I got, I don't, that's probably all in my mind, but. Uh, they told you not like, to have it, so now you want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you for your time, and I'll check into this, um, and I appreciate your your uh, help. Yeah, you're certainly welcome. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll come right back. we got plenty to go. If you have a question along the way, 745-5800. We'll be right back with more with Metabolic Coaching and Dr. Justin Anderson. Welcome back in to Cut the Killer Carbs right here on AM580 with Dr. Justin Anderson. Check us out on Facebook, Cut the Killer Carbs. MetabolicCoaching.net. Of course, you can always call us directly at 448 all right, uh, let's go back out to the phone line. Say good morning. Welcome into the program. Is that me? Yes, that's you, sir. That, that's Welcome me. To the show. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the program. Yes. Yeah, I uh, uh, have been interested in nutrition for many, many years, and I was kind of <clears throat> picking up on Doug Kaufman. Have you ever heard of Doug? Yeah. Yeah, sure have. Yeah. Okay. Well, he is. He says science can't tell the difference between the fungus and cancer. And the antibiotics, chemotherapy, radiation, or fungus, people don't realize that, I guess. And there's a lot of things you can do to knock the fungus out of your body. And when you knock the fungus out of your body, you know, a lot of times uh, all your diseases disappear. You know, they're, uh -huh. they're not not there. So, uh, I, I don't know, so there's a lot of antifungals, uh, red rice yeast, olive extract, cinnamon, 
is an antifungal, not statin, not catrain, decatrain. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. The study, yeah, kills fungus in yeast and mold problems. And we, there's just all kinds of things that I've got <clears throat> picked up. And then if you want to uh, kill the fungus, they say you use oregano oil by the droplet, eight to ten drops under the tongue daily kills fungus. You know, I've, then, I've been through a lot of Doug Kaufman's material. I think he's, I think Doug Kaufman's great. I think he's definitely on to something. Basically what I do is I look for the similarities. And there are a lot of programs that work and a lot of programs that help people get better and feel better and have more energy. And so I look for what's the commonalities between them all. And the commonality yeah. is going to be you cut out the sugar and the grains and the refined carbohydrates because the sugar, the grains, the refined carbohydrates, uh, what you, well, some people say sugar, grains, and refined carbohydrates, they spike your sugar too high, they spike your insulin too high, and that causes the problem. And what Doug Kaufman will say is the sugar, the grains, and the refined carbohydrates, they feed, they feed fungus. And yeah, so, well, well, the sugar, the sugar sure does because sugar, Sugar uh, makes the fungus grow, and fungus loves sugar. That's right. And, 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 and your, your body takes a saltine cracker and breaks that saltine cracker, or a slice of bread breaks it down into sugar, yeah. which feeds the fungus at that point. Yeah. So what you yeah, do? Well, 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 good leafy vegetables, you know, and you know, like, kind of like in the Bible, you know, that old boy, those people that ate the veggies, you know, they seem to do a lot better. And we can do a lot better if we stay away from the sugar and, the, like you said, the carbohydrates and just stay on the leafy vegetables. Well, leafy uh, vegetables. Well, the other thing that doesn't, so you're right, green leafy vegetables, uh, they don't feed fungus, and so that's a good thing, number one. The other thing that doesn't feed fungus is fat. Uh, fungus doesn't feed on fat. It feeds on sugar. So uh, butter, coconut oil, the fats found in meat, uh, it doesn't feed fungus either. Yeah. Well, listen, I'll let you go. I just wanted to call in and uh, give my uh, stuff about old Doug Kaufman. I always kind of liked him. He's got a lot of good stuff. Yeah, and I, I like the Doug Kaufman material, too. I think it's definitely worth reading. Yeah. Uh, and f there are some people who have some odd medical problems that, you know, uh, they may even get on a <laughs> low-carbohydrate diet, and, and, it, and it gets better, but it doesn't go away. And I've always, uh, not always, but I've, I've thought that in those cases, uh, it may be reasonable to try an antifungal, just like you're saying, yeah. an antifungal for a month or, or six weeks, and see if that will help to get rid of the residual problems that's left over. Well, I have a kind of a deal that I'd go by. If it's made by nature, it's good. If it ain't, <laughs> stay, yeah. away from man's food. stay away from man's food. You'll get problems. You're on the right Thank track. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Yeah, God bless. Phone lines are always open, 745-5800. If you have a question along the way, 745-5800. Ah. Let me just mention, so the uh, all kinds of fats, all kinds of fats contain a mixture of fat. So people will say coconut oil is saturated fat, but really it's a mixture. Coconut oil is a mixture of saturated monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat and all the oils are like that but the oils that contain the most saturated fat and these are the ones that uh, are the ones that your body basically knows what to do with in this order first there's coconut oil and then butter so coconut oil is 92 percent saturated fat and people say butter is saturated fat it's 68 percent saturated fat okay and then next is beef tallow, which you don't get very often. Um, and then palm oil and then olive oil. Olive oil, that people think of it as a monounsaturated fat. Well, olive oil is 75% monounsaturated, but it's got about 14% saturated. And then lard, um, lard is 41% saturated fat, but it contains 47% monounsaturated. So, you know, there are people who tout the Mediterranean diet. They say you need more monounsaturated fats because the monounsaturated fats are supposed to be healthy for the heart. Well, lard is 47% monounsaturated fat, even though people think of it as being unhealthy for the heart. As you go down the list, uh, 
as you go down the list, these all of the ones I just mentioned are very low in the polyunsaturated fats, and that's what you want to avoid, the polyunsaturated omega-6 fats. Um, but as you go fur further into the vegetable oils, they contain a lot of the polyunsaturated fats. Oils like safflower oil, canola oil, peanut oil, corn oil, soybean oil, and safflower oil. Those things com contain between 28% and 78% of the omega-6 polyunsaturated fats. Wow, that's pretty steep. And those are the polyunsaturated fats right. that are inflammatory. They get oxidized, which means damaged. Um, and those are the ones that can cause, uh, that can be done like in the experiment. You take enough of those, you can get diabetic blood sugars, insulin resistance, and high triglycerides uh, virtually overnight. So the one of the issues people run into is that when you go buy french fries at the local you know the local burger joint the french fries first of all are potatoes which are high in carbohydrates and spike your insulin you put on top of that that they're fried in a vegetable oil the vegetable oil is worsening insulin resistance it's been heated so it's damaged oxidized and then you have a real recipe for problems the combination of the polyunsaturated oil plus are the you heat saying i cannot have my mcdonald's fries doctor give me a break um <laughs> Well, I'm trying to. I'm trying. I'm trying to think. No way. I'm loving no. it. I'm loving it. You know, um, uh, there's some people who would say you should never have a fry, period, but mainly because of the damage from the oils, from the heated polyunsaturated oils. Um, I'll tell you what we do in my family is there's five of us. We go to eat and we'll order one order of fries and we'll split it between five people. And so that's kind of our compromise at present. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's all good. I do like an occasional chicken fry every once in a while. But, again, as you've talked about many times, you say, look, you can't. it's hard to do that when you say, well, I'm going to have, and we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. where you know people say, okay, well, I, I'm going to practice that. I'm going to really try to... You know, watch the highly processed sugars, refined carbohydrates. Um, I'm going to eat clean. I'm going to do all these things. And then, you know, they do it for a few days. And they're like, ah, you know, I did good this week. I did real good. I had salads and spinach. And I had the good uh, roughage that uh, promotes good gut bacteria, mm -hmm. which, you know, yep. we got to have good gut bacteria, which is wonderful and, and helps to ward off all kinds of diseases and all whatnot. And then uh, come Friday, Saturday, you say, man, I'm going to reward myself. I'm going to have the big old chicken fry and french fries and, yeah. and, and mashed potatoes and gravy uh, for doing such good work. And you always and it, contend it, that it throws you off throws for about you four off. days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like, well, then why even bother? It, you know, it, it, there's two things that throw you off. I mean, if you eat, if you eat the big chicken fries and the french fries, um, the carbohydrates in that meal is going to throw you out of ketosis and it can take you four days to get back into ketosis and ketosis just means burning fat burning fat for fuel instead of burning sugar the second thing that throws you off is that the fry you know the the chicken fry is going to be covered in wheat flour and that wheat flour is it wheat is addictive and so then it makes you want more and want more and then um the other thing that throws you off is it's going to be fried in one of those vegetable oils which is going to damage uh, damage your insulin response, uh, and insulin is a fat storage hormone, so it's going to cause problems there too. Yeah, and that's that's right. But uh, so it's hard to say. I mean, there, that, so there's I guess it's there's no such thing technically as uh, a reward day, right? Well, it's just it's just like smoking. Once you stop smoking. You don't reward yourself once a week with a cigarette. <laughs> right. right? That is true. You don't say, hey, I've, I've been good all week, and I'll just have one cigarette because it doesn't work like that. You'll, you'll go back to smoking a pack a day. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great analogy. Um, so true. And I, I, and I have, uh, well, it was 12 years ago or so, but, uh, you know, I went three weeks without any nicotine, and I was doing okay. I was a little bit spaced out mm -hmm. as your body's detoxifying. Uh, the fact that, hey, I, I don't get the nicotine that I was used to that you had been giving me for the last 25 years. Yeah. now, it, And if you just go, and you talk about this a lot about 
the idea of just going cold turkey and uh, saying, okay. It's the most successful way people have ever stopped uh, smoking. Yes. Okay. And, and, and so my question is, is that I'll same, th- same thing with, with, the, with the low carbohydrate That's diet, right. right? You, you just go, you, okay, one day I'm making a change for life and you, here, Pam. You clean, it, clean out your pantry, uh, clean out your pantry, order the burgers without a bun. Uh, you can give away your food to neighbors. Uh, <laughs> but just, just, just divorce yourself from the, the refined carbohydrates and the grains. It's the most successful way to do it. Um, and then the with people who do have like some withdrawal, they, they can have withdrawal from getting rid of the sugar and the grains. It lasts between, it happens to 30% of people. So 70% no withdrawal from the sugar or the grains, but 30% do get some withdrawal and it lasts between four to 14 days and then you feel better. Um, the, 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 the brain fog and the brain, the change in your brain chemistry from the nicotine would be a much longer kind of protracted, longer protracted kind of process. So, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, but part of what I've done part of the way I designed the metabolic coaching program is it's all about changing people's behavior. And so part of that was to research highly successful stop smoking programs or highly successful stop drinking alcohol programs and see, you know, incorporate those parts uh, into this behavior modification program called metabolic coaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the key. I mean, but uh, you know, again, I've been I've been just toying around the edges, right? I haven't got to that point where I've just, just said, okay, seven days a week, I'm not going to, I mean, this is what I'm going to do from here on out. What? I think more and more people end up to get diagnosed, and I've talked about this before, mm-hmm. that they, you know, they go into their That's, doctor and they're Somebody like, has something, a diagnosis they're and they're just, ready for a change. Yeah, and they're just right. like, okay, I'm on the edge of the cliff here. And, and, and those are my clients because they're like, you know, I'm buying, I'm buying 45-inch pants. I can't, I can't buy any bigger pants. Or they get diagnosed with diabetes and they're started on metformin. Or they're diagnosed with prediabetes and they've seen all the complications of diabetes in their family. Or they're on their third blood pressure pill and they're wondering, what on earth is wrong? Aren't these pills working? Uh, and, and that happens with diabetes too. People will end up on injections and then at that point they're ready for a change. And when they're ready for a change, I'm there. And I'll tell you that if you're out there listening and you're ready for a change, call. You know, you can look up uh, metabolitcoaching.net. The phone number is there. Call 448-0322 and we'll help you make the change because you you can't medicate yourself out of something that you eat yourself into and that happens over and over that's why people start off on one blood blood pressure pill and then they end up on two and then they end up on three and what's funny is that blood pressure 95 percent of all blood pressure high blood pressure 95 percent of all high blood pressure is defined as essential hypertension and essential means we don't know the cause we don't know why their blood pressure is high well, I'll tell you the cause. The cause is too much carbohydrates and sugar in the diet mm-hmm. because I've had innumerable clients who, when they cut the carbohydrates and sugar out of the diet, their blood pressure just normalizes, and they get off their blood pressure pills. So essential hypertension, or if your doctor says he doesn't know, that medical science doesn't know why you have high blood pressure, um, then try the very low carbohydrate diet. Yeah, that's a good point. What are you giggling about? No, I just, I just, uh, I tell you, it's true. It's absolutely true. And the the fact of what I find fascinating is so many people out there that have uh, listened to this broadcast and they've just kind of done it on their own. They can go to YouTube. They can go to the website. They don't have to sign up for nothing, just to implement. Yeah. Now, if you want to sign up, you can. That's they're going to get more personal and directions from you and emails and 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 talks and all that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff but you can do this on your own it's not rocket science jim Jim stewart was just in here talking about his son uh who's been i've never met Well, colonel lewis did the same thing my co-host he he was listening to the show and said i think i'll try that and he lost a ton of weight (laughs) and so there'll be people i've never run into i've never met and they'll con just like Jim Stewart's son, and he said he's lost 60 pounds. Yeah, that's a lot. Just by implementing 
what's on the website, metaboliccoaching.net. Just do it. As the Nike slogan says, it. the little swoosh. All right? Just Tr do it. Try, you will not. Do, you will. Uh, That's what? Yoda. That's Yoda. <laughs> What what else, uh, Doctor? Would you like to say before we wrap up this morning? Anything else uh, you might want to mention before we uh, get out of here on today's show? Well, the basically uh, the let's recap the fats. Okay, you want to eliminate hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. And you had asked me about that. What does that entail? Well, right. Number one, it's on the back of the package. Number two, something like vegetable shortening that's hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated or trans fat. Also, th you, there'll be products in the supermarket like uh, uh, Cool Whip. Cool Whip can be made with hydrogenated vegetable oil. So I saw a television commercial just last night where they were promoting Cool Whip in the canister. And so the, the actors, you know, in this commercial, they were spraying Cool Whip all over the place, like putting a coffee, put it on the That's waffles. not Cool Whip. That's Ready Whip. Ready Whip. Yeah, but that's that's still, that's not good. The Right? Re Ready Whip is, is on the label, Ready Whip does not contain hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, but it does contain sugar. Ready so, Whip. So if you want to put whipped cream on everything, that's absolutely perfectly fine. You can put whipped cream on your spinach. I mean, not whip it, but you, you, can make cream, you can make cream spinach. You can put whipped cream on your, uh, on your almond flour waffle, whatever. But whip it yourself. Yeah, right. Uh, buy heavy whipping cream uh, and, and just whip it yourself. The best, you know, uh, people talk a lot. You might, might have heard of grass-fed beef or grass-fed um, grass beef or cheese from grass-fed cows, milk from grass-fed cows. Well, that's an, another aspect of the fats is that if you can afford to buy grass-fed, buy grass-fed beef or grass-fed milk or cheese or butter when you can because it contains more omega-3 fats. Mm -hmm. And omega-3 is another type of polyunsaturated fat, but it's an anti-inflammatory type of polyunsaturated fat. So that's what grass-fed is all about. Um... So you eliminate the hydrogenated vegetable oils. Uh, you minimize polyunsaturated omega-6 oils. Those are vegetable oils like safflower, soybean, corn, peanut. Uh, but you want to maximize uh, saturated fat because your body knows what to do with saturated fat. And also maximize monounsaturated. That's your olive oil. But if you're going to heat something, heat a saturated fat like coconut oil, butter, lard, that sort of thing, something that has lower amount of mono, that has less monounsaturated fat in it. Um, they say all the time that, uh, you know, Americans' diet is deficient in omega-3 fats. It's deficient in omega-3 fats because when you take a cow on a feedlot and you feed it grain, they make a lot of omega-6 fats and not enough omega-3s. But if you take a cow in the wild, a cow eats grass, and they make a lot of omega-3 fats. So we're deficient in omega-3s not because uh, not because we're not eating enough fish, because fish contains omega-3s. It's because our cows eat grain. So for some people, taking a fish oil supplement or a krill oil supplement is a reasonable thing if you're not eating grass-fed beef, butter, and cheese all the time. Yeah, that's a good plan. Good plan. It's good. It's always good. I, I'm a sardine cat. I love sardines. I mean, I'll, I'll eat sardines in my macaroni and cheese, right? Eat, eat, eat sardines <laughs> at night in bed. There's macaroni Wade. and cheese. I love it. Wade with his shirt off, <laughs> eating sardines. <laughs> and the, the health coach is over there <laughs> holding her nose. Yeah, she's like, really? Uh, I like, and anchovies are actually even better, although I've noticed lately um, anchovies are in uh, short supply right now. Maybe they're having some kind of problem with those in the oceans. I don't know. But nevertheless, the smaller the fish, the less mercury, too. So we all know that. That's always a good thing. But mm -hmm. uh, nevertheless, it, it can go on and on and on, I'm telling you. But uh, the bottom line is just start. Get get going. And that's the key. And uh, you'll feel better for it. Trust me, you will. An easy way to start is to go to the website on metaboliccoaching.net. Click mm -hmm. on the free content tab. Uh, there are written instructions there, uh, a video seminar to watch, um, 
even the audio tracks we talked about, the guided meditations that work in a similar way to hypnosis, they're all there. And you can start just like we were talking about Jim's son and uh, the colonel. Yeah. Just like they did it. No, no kidding. That's what they did. And uh, that's a good thing. All right, uh, Dr. Justin Anderson, everybody. Again, Metabolic Coaching. Check it out. Metaboliccoaching.net. Cut the killer carbs on Facebook. Uh, Once again, we appreciate you being out. We'll see you back next Tuesday on the show. Have a wonderful Labor Day weekend as well. And we'll see you back here next Tuesday. You too. Thank you, Wade. Have a good holiday. You too. Stick around. We'll be right back with more right here on AM580.